When I was in college, I went on a cruise from Florida down to the Bahamas and then back. About halfway to the Bahamas, we hit some bad weather. The boat was rocking pretty aggressively to the point where we weren't allowed to go onto the upper decks of the ship. Chairs and tables were shifting around. The crew and the staff were unconcerned. This is something they've been through. They, they sail this route regularly. They know the ship is equipped to handle pretty rough weather. But as a passenger, it was really terrifying to just suddenly realized that despite the the safety, the perceived safety of this huge multi-hundred million dollar ship, the reality is, is when you're out in the ocean, Mother Nature's gonna do whatever it's gonna do. Now, fortunately, the, the weather did subside and sure enough, the ship was fine and we sailed through it. But it always stuck with me that if you're out in the middle of the ocean and something goes bad, it goes really bad. The two stories I'm gonna share are about groups of people that were out on the open ocean and something went bad. Very, very bad. Before we get going on today's stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you have come to the right channel because that's all I do and I upload three to four, sometimes even five times every week. And if that's of interest to you, I would encourage you to gently arm bar the like button and then subscribe to my channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of those weekly uploads. All right, let's get into the stories. In the very early hours of May 26, 2013, three tugboats were towing this massive Chevron oil tanker in the Gulf of Guinea. They were about 32 kilometers off the coast of Nigeria. Two of the tugboats were pressed up against the sides of this huge tanker to provide stability as it gets towed. The third tugboat, which was called the Jascone 4, sat way out in front and had the main tow line strapped to the front of the tanker and was doing all of the actual towing. On board that lead tugboat, the Jaskin 4, were 12 crew members who had all been hired by a company called West African Ventures. It was a Nigerian-based company. They owned the ship and they had contracted them to come out and be a part of this towing operation. One of the crew members was a man named Harrison Okin. He was from Nigeria and he was the ship's cook. At around 4.45 that morning, Harrison was in his quarters. He had been sleeping, but he had woken up because the ship was swaying pretty dramatically. It was very rough seas, but he, like the rest of the crew, were accustomed to rough, choppy water. So he gets up, he unlocks his bedroom door, and he goes out into the hall. When he looks down the hall, he sees that all of the other doors are shut and locked. The crew of the Jascone 4 had a policy that whenever they slept or were in their rooms, they would shut and lock the doors because piracy is a really big threat. After Harrison looked down the hall at all of these locked doors, he started making his way down the hall in the other direction towards the bathroom. He kind of stumbled down the hall as the ship rocked from the very rough seas. He gets to the bathroom and shuts the door at 4.50 in the morning. We know this because at 4.50 in the morning, a rogue wave hit the side of Jaskin 4 and almost completely flipped it upside down. Snapped the tow line, the ship is completely on its side and it's sinking very fast. He tried to push open the metal bathroom door, but already a surge of water is coming down the hall and pressing him into the bathroom. Pushes against that surge of water and gets the door open and now he's standing on the ceiling of the hallway that he was just in a moment ago because the boat is now completely inverted. And he's looking down the hall. Three of the crew members have managed to come out of their locked rooms and in a panic are trying to make their way up to the exit. He sees them as another surge of water blasts in through one of the windows and literally sweeps them away. And he knows they're dead. The power cuts out right as another surge of water is coming down the hall to him. He turns his body and this rush of seawater, this freezing seawater comes pouring down the hall and it takes Harrison and throws him down this little hallway and slams him into yet another bathroom. It was actually an officer's bathroom. It was connected to an officer's room. And so now he's inside of this other bathroom and he's kind of like clamoring naturally, instinctively to go up to try to get to air because that's what anyone would do if you're underwater in a panic. And as he's swimming up, he couldn't believe it when he gets to air. He, his head clears the surface in the bathroom and he's, he's in an air pocket, but it's pitch black. All the power is out. The ship is rapidly sinking. The water is freezing. Harrison has only got his boxer shorts on. He doesn't have a light source. He doesn't have food. He doesn't have water. And he has this couple cubic feet of air. 
that any moment he's waiting for it to collapse. He knows these are his final moments, and he remembers a prayer that his wife had texted him before he started this particular job. And he started reciting the prayer in his head as he waited to die. And the ship slams into the ocean floor, but the air pocket doesn't collapse. So Harrison is in this tiny little air pocket 30 meters below the ocean's surface. At this point, even though Harrison has no idea how he just survived the shipwreck, he now has to deal with the fact that he's eventually going to run out of air. He'll die of dehydration. He'll die of exposure. He's in freezing water up to his neck. And most terrifyingly, sharks and other animals are gonna start converging on the ship to look for food. And he is in a bathroom that although there's the air pocket, the door is open into the main hall and his entire body is inside of this bathroom. Meaning if a, if a shark were in the hallway swimming down the inside of this hall and it made it to the bathroom, he's completely exposed with no way to shut the door. It was wedged open. So his lower half is, is completely exposed to whatever wildlife is inside of this ship. So he literally is just waiting to die. He just doesn't know how he's going to die. After sitting there for quite a while, he started to feel very cold, and he knew that if he didn't find a way to get his body a little bit higher into the air pocket, basically get his upper body out of the water, that he was certainly going to die soon, just from hypothermia. Even though he knew he was doomed, his will to live was just, it was bubbling through. He did not want to die yet. And as he's sitting there thinking, how is he gonna get himself up into this air pocket? Because he had nothing he could step on or kind of stand on he realized that right next to him, there was the officer's room. This was the officer's bathroom and the door was open. He could, if he wanted to, he could dive down and swim through the door and go into the officer's bedroom and look for supplies. And in his mind, he thought he could probably pull off some of the paneling because it's gonna be pitch black in there if he just swam straight to the far side of the room, he could get to some of the, the fake wood paneling or whatever it was and he could yank it down. And as he's building up his courage to dive into pitch black water, he starts hearing this horrible sound of large sea creatures smashing into the boat. They were basically looking for entrance points into the boat. And then they would come into the boat, sharks, and he could hear them bumping up against the insides of the ship. And all he's thinking is, I'm completely exposed. I'm doomed, I gotta go. I gotta go in there. I gotta at least make an attempt to save myself. And so listening to sharks and other animals searching for things to eat, he takes a deep breath and in total darkness, he dives down and swims into the officer's bedroom. And as he's swimming, because he's just going straight across to the far wall to start yanking off that paneling, he's bumping into things that he believes are bodies. He doesn't know, but he thinks they are. He gets to the far wall and he yanks off a piece of paneling. He swims back. One successful trip. He goes back down and he makes a number of trips until he's able to fashion that little raft he had in mind, like a little step stool that pushed him up into the air pocket to where half of his upper body was now out of the freezing water. Also, while he was in the officer's room, even though it was pitch black, he was kind of like feeling around for things and he wound up finding a bottle of soda and a flashlight. So he turns on his flashlight and he drinks his soda and he just takes a breath. Even though he's still in the same terrible situation, He's thankful for that little victory. About 24 hours would go by where he has this light on and he's nursing the soda. He knows he's either gonna die from sharks, hypothermia, dehydration, something's going to kill him. But part of him is thinking, maybe if a dive team is able to locate the ship, they're gonna come down to retrieve bodies. And maybe they'll find me. Maybe I can hold out that long. And so as he's, as he's thinking about this, he's, he's getting a little flicker of hope, two horrible things happen. His light goes out, flashlight doesn't work, at the same time that he describes hearing the large sea creatures make their way into the officer's room right next to him. So I want you to think about this. You're at the bottom of the ocean. You're in a ship that has sunk. You're in a little air pocket you really don't have any supplies to last longer than a few days. It's total darkness. You had your flashlight, it's gone out. It's totally dark. A shark that has been eating your friends, or more than one shark, is now literally feet away from you, and you can hear it eating the bodies that apparently are in there. You are exposed to them because there's an entrance to that room and there's an entrance to the hall. 
The fear must have been indescribable. For the next 36 hours, Harrison sat there listening to a shark slam into the wall, but never attack him. He heard sharks in the main section of the ship bumping around, waiting at any moment that if the ship were to just tilt a little bit, his air pocket's gonna collapse. It's unfathomable how terrible those 36 hours must have been. At the 60 hour mark, he hears what sounds like something metal banging on the outside of the ship. He notices through the, through the hallway, because he has a bit of a vantage point through the water down the hall in front of him, he sees a flicker of light. And there's no light down here, so it really stood out. Without even thinking about it, he takes a deep breath and swims right into the hallway, the one place he had not been since he had gone into the bathroom, because there are sharks. And he starts swimming farther and farther and farther away from his air pocket, and he's running out of air. He can't find the light. He doesn't even know if he saw a light. He thinks he might be hallucinating, and he's realizing, I'm almost out of air. You know, he's looking around, and he decides, I gotta go back to my air pocket. And he turns around, and he's trying to swim back. He's looking for his bathroom. He's swimming as fast as he can. He's about to run out of air, and he makes it to his air pocket, and his head goes up, and he takes a big breath. And he's not sure if he really actually saw the light or not. And he's thinking, that was it. I thought I was gonna be rescued, but I was just imagining it. And then, a miracle. It was a diver and the diver had come back. The diver was part of a crew that had been sent down to recover bodies. No one lives for three days underwater. So the diver comes down his way and Harrison knew that he was going to scare the daylights out of this diver. And so he gently touched him on the back and the diver reacts really violently because he's expecting it to be an animal of some kind. And Harrison reaches out and just grabs the diver's hand and squeezes it gently and shows him his hand. And the diver's got a big light on his head pokes his head up into this air pocket, you see this man that for the past 36 hours has been in total darkness with absolutely no way out. He was done for. And the look on Harrison's face is just, it's priceless. They fitted Harrison with a dive mask and they brought him up. He did not immediately go to the surface because he had been at depth for so long, he had to go through something called decompression. If he had just breathed air at normal pressure, he would have died. So they put him in a decompression chamber for 60 hours before actually bringing him to the surface. And so ultimately Harrison was okay, but the trauma of this experience was so extreme that to this day, Harrison's wife says that basically every night he wakes up thinking he's on a sinking ship. In 1983, 23-year-old Tammy Ashcroft was engaged to 34-year-old Richard Sharp. The couple had bonded over their shared love of sailing, and generally they spent more time on the water than on land. In October of that year, a friend approached the couple and asked if they'd be willing to take their 44-foot yacht from Tahiti to San Diego. Though the trip would be over 4,000 miles long, significantly longer than any one trip either of them had ever taken on the open water, they both felt very confident in their seafaring abilities, and so they agreed to do it. The journey started out fine, but at the two-week mark, when they were just north of the equator, they heard about a hurricane that could be making its way up to where they were going. And so even though they anticipated it would kind of peter out and actually not even hit them, they decided it was still in their best interest to try to sail completely away from the path of the storm to safer waters. But over the next couple of days, the storm only intensified and continued to change directions, making it really hard to predict where safer waters was going to be. And so Tammy and Richard kept desperately trying to get farther and farther away from the storm, but it was like every time they would change course and get farther away, the storm would speed up and change directions and still be coming straight for them. And so finally, it got to the point where Tammy and Richard realized they could not actually outpace the storm, that they would have to weather it. And so on the day it was going to hit them, they donned their rain gear and they boarded up the windows and then they stood on the deck of their yacht looking out at the horizon as this category four hurricane is just barreling straight towards them. Tammy would go on to say that she never fully appreciated just how terrifying being in a hurricane is out at sea until she was in one. She said it was a constant barrage of 50 foot waves that would literally launch the yacht. It would become airborne and then it would come crashing down. And each time it landed, she felt like the boat was gonna break in two. And then as soon as it did slam down, another wave would land on top of them. And so it just felt like at any moment, the ship was just gonna be consumed by the ocean. But Tammy and Richard were excellent sailors and Richard was up in the cockpit and he was doing everything he could to keep the boat from not flipping over 
And after a little while, he had figured out a way to kind of ride the waves in such a way that they would not get totally tossed each time. And after a couple hours of just absolute chaos, it started to seem like they had made it through the worst of the storm and that more than likely they were going to make it out of this thing relatively unharmed. And so around this time, as the storm was beginning to calm down, Richard is anchored in place in the cockpit. He's a safety line attached to him to the ground, so he's not going anywhere. And Tammy is just exhausted. It was just so stressful being through the storm. And Richard noticed, and he says, Tammy, I got this up here. Go down into the cabin and just try to get some rest. And Tammy was very grateful and she agreed. She opened the doors to the cabin and she had made it all the way downstairs when she hears Richard yell out from up in the cockpit, oh my God, before a rogue wave comes crashing into their boat head on, flipping the boat backwards like a backflip onto the top. So it's upside down in the water. And Tammy would say it felt like someone ripped the boat out from under her feet. And then she came crashing down and smashed her head and was knocked unconscious. When Tammy woke up 27 hours later, she was laying in the cabin against a chair and half on the ground. And she opens her eyes and the cabin she's in is half submerged and everything inside of it has either been thrown on the ground or it's been broken. There's papers, there's tools. I mean, the place is just a disaster down there. And she can tell the cabin is also slowly filling with water. After the boat had backflipped and Tammy had been knocked unconscious, it continued to get thrown around by waves before miraculously landing upright. Tammy could barely remember what happened and she's totally overwhelmed by what she's seeing. She's in shock and all she knows is she has to go up on deck to find Richard. And so she gets up and wades through the water. She gets to the stairs. She's yelling for Richard. She goes up on deck and she looked around and the boat was just ruined and she's yelling for Richard. She's looking around. He's nowhere to be found. And then she looks up at the cockpit where she she last saw him and she can see his safety line that was attached to him keeping him anchored to the boat was now dangling off the back of the boat she ran to the back she looked and the safety harness had actually come undone it had been broken in the storm and Richard was gone he had been swept into the ocean and he was not wearing a life jacket and Tammy would say he had actually taken it off earlier in the storm and left it down in the cabin and then when the storm was raging again he was back up top anchored in place and just didn't think to go down and get it and they both were just not thinking about it. It was just one of those things in a really chaotic situation that got overlooked. And while Tammy wanted to grieve the loss of her fiance, it was like she couldn't. Her survival instincts were kicking in and she knew if she didn't act quickly to fix this situation, she too would die. And so she began robotically taking stock of the boat's condition and she saw the masts had broken clean off, the sails were now dragging in the water, the engine, the radio, the electronic navigation system, the emergency position indicator device, all of it was ruined. And so all alone in the middle of the ocean with nothing in sight, no ships, no land, no anything, on a ruined ship that is gradually sinking after finding out your fiance has been swept out to his death in the middle of a storm, Tammy managed to stay composed and she built a makeshift sail and began sailing the ship and she also began slowly pumping the water out of the cabin. She went back into the cabin and she discovered some of the almanacs were still in there and she discovered there was a current that she thought she could get to and so using just a sextant and a watch she manually navigated this broken down ship using this makeshift sail into this current and then for 41 days she survived on canned food and peanut butter and she sailed 50 1500 miles to Hawaii and the whole time she's thinking to herself if my calculations are off that this is not the current I'm supposed to be in I will sail past Hawaii out into the open water and I will run out of food and water and I will die but she didn't die because her calculations were spot on. When Tammy finally stepped foot on land in Hawaii, she was relieved that, you know, she had made it and that she was going to live. But at the same time, she had this flood of emotions where she was suddenly so sad about the loss of Richard. It was like she really hadn't had a chance to grieve his loss because that whole time after the accident, she was focused on survival. And although Tammy would make a full recovery, it would take her six years to learn how to read again because of the head injury she sustained when the boat capsized. But when she did regain that skill, she finally stopped and she wrote her and Richard's story in a book called Red Sky and Morning that became an international bestseller and was converted into a movie called Adrift.
Growing up in southeastern Australia, Ricky McGee worked a variety of jobs, including being a carpet salesman, a prawn fisherman, a nightclub doorman, an electrician, and a bailiff. In 2006, when Ricky was 35, he was offered yet another new job in a government department in western Australia. He accepted the job, hopped in his car, and began the long drive across the desert. While on the extremely desolate Buntine Highway, which is basically a road in the middle of the desert with nothing around, no people, no buildings, nothing, He's driving along and he sees a group of three men standing outside of their car. And so Ricky assumed they must have broken down. So he pulls over to ask if they need help. And they come up to him and they're, they're so gracious that he stopped. And they said, we ran out of gas. Can we hop in with you and ride up to the next town? And Ricky says, fine, climb on in. So the three men, they get in his car and they take off. And then after that, Ricky has no memory. He thinks one of them drugged him by putting something in his drink, which was sitting in the center console and was open, but he doesn't know for sure. Ricky remembers waking up and he was in a camp and he sat up and he was unrestrained and he looks out in front of him and the three guys that had gotten in the car with him were sitting on rocks looking at him and one of them had a gun that he was aiming at Ricky. And so Ricky's just looking around, not really sure what's going on and one of them gets up and comes over and offers him water. Ricky takes a sip of the water because he's very thirsty and Ricky believes the water was poisoned as well because shortly after taking a sip, he passed out again. When Ricky regained consciousness a second time, he couldn't move. It was dark and he felt something tugging at his skin Skin, and as he's laying there, he realizes there is black plastic right over his face. He's been buried. And then he realizes there is a dingo that is standing on his chest that has tugged the plastic away from his face because the dog is trying to take a bite out of Ricky. But the dog is the one that saved his life by creating an air pocket in the plastic. Ricky screamed at the dog. The dog panicked and leapt out of the hole and ran away. And Ricky was able to work his finger up to this hole and pull it all the way open and push himself out of the plastic. And he realized there wasn't much dirt or rocks that had been placed over him. They probably thought he would just suffocate in the middle of the desert and no one's gonna find him anyways. But here he is. And so he stands up in his grave and he looks around and there's no sign of the three men. His car is gone. He realizes they also took all of his clothing, even his shoes. He's got no food. He's got no water. He's in the middle of the desert. There's no roads. There's no people. There's no buildings. There's nothing. At this point, confusion overtook Ricky because he just could not make sense of what had just happened to him. Who were these three people? Why'd they attack him? Did they just wanna steal his car? Were they prepared to kill him? To take his car he just he couldn't understand it and so there was some shade behind a little bush and he sat down in the shade and he just sat there for several hours thinking you know what am i gonna do but not being one to let pessimism crowd his psyche ricky decides if he's gonna survive he needs to get up and get moving after 10 days of just wandering through the desert and seeing nobody he came across this fairly large water hole and he decided, you know what, I have a better chance of surviving if I just wait here until someone comes and rescues me than if I just keep walking through the desert where I'm bound to just eventually die. And so he makes a makeshift shelter next to this water hole and he begins to wait. After almost a week of being at the spot, Ricky had still not had a single thing to eat since this whole ordeal began. And so he's sitting there, his stomach is in knots, he's in so much pain, he's starving. And just then a lizard happened to run across in front of him and without even thinking, he just reached out and grabbed it and took a bite out of it. And it was like all of the sudden this primal side of him was unleashed and suddenly he had no issues eating anything that moved in the desert. For weeks, Ricky stayed at the spot spot drinking from the water hole and eating lizards, frogs, leeches, snakes, grasshoppers, caterpillars, basically anything that moved anywhere in the desert, he would chase it down and he would eat it. In fact, he developed an affinity for certain frogs over others, and he said in terms of eating leeches that they were okay, but you needed to eat them really, really quickly, otherwise they would attach to the insides of your mouth. Ricky also ate plants, but he would even say he had no idea what was harmful and what was okay to eat. He just ate what tasted good and got really lucky. But as much as Ricky was eating, it wasn't enough. He was slowly losing his battle with the desert and he was starving to death. And so Ricky believed he didn't have enough time to just continue to wait at this particular spot. He needed to go out and find help. And so he left that water hole and began stumbling through the desert all over again. But he was so weak, he only lasted for a couple of days before he found another water hole and he stopped there and he built yet another shelter, this time believing it would become his tomb. Over the next couple of days, wild dogs began coming to his camp and circling his camp. It was like they knew he was about to die soon, 
or they at least knew he was weak enough they could probably overpower him soon. At night, Ricky had to barricade the door of his shelter because the dogs would get aggressive and they'd come up to the door and try to paw their way inside. On the 70th day of his ordeal, Ricky believed he was probably within a day or two of passing away, and so he put a cross on the outside of his shelter, believing that would be his tomb, and at least this way someone might notice it and find his body, and then hopefully let his family know what happened to him. But on the 71st day, when Ricky happened happened to be standing outside of his shelter, two ranch hands happened to be way off the road in the outback and were looking in his direction and they saw him. And when they went over to him, they said he looked like a walking skeleton and Ricky practically collapsed as soon as he saw help had finally arrived. The ranch hands evacuated Ricky from the desert and brought him to a hospital where he weighed less than 100 pounds. At the beginning of his ordeal, he weighed over 230 pounds. Despite filing a report with the police about the three men who attacked him, they were never caught. Ricky checked himself out of the hospital after six days and made a full recovery. He ended up writing a book about his experience and he now works construction in Dubai. By 1985, the remote and extremely dangerous west face of the Ciula Grande in the Peruvian Andes was still unclimbed. But in 1985, two very ambitious climbers, 25-year-old Joe Simpson and 21-year-old Simon Yates, decided they were going to be the first to conquer it. And by all accounts, they seemed up for the job, having already conquered numerous difficult Scottish ice cliffs, as well as a number of large mountain faces in the Alps. So in early June of that year, the pair flew to Peru and they arrived at the base camp that was nearest to the Ciula Grande, but it was still five miles away, so they couldn't actually see what they were going to be climbing yet. On June 5th, when the weather was good enough, the pair left camp and worked their way around the huge lake across the glacier to the base of this cliff they're about to climb, and when they saw it for the first time, they couldn't believe how steep and dangerous it looked. But over the next three days, they managed to make it up this cliff despite a blizzard hitting them halfway through, and they reached the summit. To them, this was a crowning achievement. They had done it. They had written their names in the history books. But in reality, the thing that people would remember them for was not for reaching the top of Ciula Grande. It was for what happened when they started going down. Because of how steep this mountain was, and because of the blizzard that was not going away, it was actually getting worse, the descent was going to be much more challenging than the ascent. So shortly after 10 a.m. on June 8th, Joe and Simon left the summit and began very carefully making their way down the mountain. At 11 a.m., disaster struck when Joe lost his footing and fell to the bottom of an ice cliff and shattered his leg. Initially, they both assumed this was a death sentence for Joe because there's no way he can actually climb down the mountain now, and certainly Simon can't actually carry him down the mountain. They were so high up, and it's so steep. There's just no way. But Simon wanted to at least try to save his friend, so he climbed down to him. He gave him some mild painkillers that he had, and then he attached his rope to Joe, and then Simon anchored himself in the snow, and he began lowering Joe down the mountain, all 300 feet of his rope. And when he would stop, Joe at the other end would anchor himself in the snow with his ice picks, and then Simon would climb down to Joe and he'd repeat the process over and over and over again, lowering Joe 300 feet at a time. This went on for hours and hours and hours, just backbreaking work for Simon. And Joe, meanwhile, is in excruciating pain from his broken leg. And to make matters worse, the storm had gotten so bad that the visibility between Simon and Joe was zero. So as Simon is lowering Joe, he can't see what he's lowering Joe onto, but they had no other choice. That was the only way they could get him down. And so at 5 p.m. that night, Simon accidentally lowers Joe over a cliff. And Joe, as soon as he's hanging off the edge, all of his weight is on the rope, and suddenly the rope is flying out of Simon's hands, and he manages to self-arrest and stop him from careening over the edge. But now, Simon is the only thing holding Joe from tumbling to his death. And Simon is being slowly drugged down the mountain. He can't anchor himself in. And so they're in the middle of this inhospitable environment. In the middle of the night, a storm is raging. It's freezing cold. They can't communicate with each other. They can't hear each other or see each other. And Simon is just hoping that Joe is going to be able to grab onto something and kind of take his weight off the rope. Otherwise, this is going to end badly for both of them. But unfortunately, the cliff was at an angle. So Joe was dangling off of it and he couldn't touch the wall. He had nothing to grab onto. He was just dangling 
dangling in the air. And so as Simon tries to move the rope to try to signal to Joe to take your weight off the rope, Joe is trying to climb up the rope, but his hands are starting to get frostbit. He's weak, he's in pain, he can't do anything about it. So for the next two and a half hours, Simon is desperately trying to regain an anchor in the snow, but every second that goes by, he's getting pulled farther and farther and farther down the mountain. He can't see how close he is to the edge. He knows he's getting close. And so finally at 7.30 p.m. with no other option, he pulls out a knife and he cuts the rope. As soon as the rope was cut, Simon fell backwards. He was safe. Nothing was pulling him off the cliff any longer, but he knew he had just sent Joe to his death. Except Joe didn't die. When that rope was cut, he fell 150 feet and smashed into the ground, except what he hit was a thin sheet of ice that broke from his weight, and he fell another 80 feet into this massive ice crevasse. Joe was knocked unconscious from the fall, but when he woke up, he was laying on his side. He opened his eyes and he looked around and he couldn't believe he was alive. And he's looking around, he doesn't know where he is, it's totally dark. He turns on his headlamp and he realizes he's fallen into an ice crevasse and he looks down and he's on this little ledge that's overlooking a much, much deeper fall. He looks down and this ice crevasse seems to just go on infinitely into this black chasm. And he realizes when he fell, had he fallen a foot over, that's where he would have gone. So it's a miracle he's alive, but now he's trapped in the middle of an ice crevasse 80 feet down. He can't go down and he can't go up. At the time, Joe didn't know if Simon had fallen off the cliff with him or if he had cut the rope but the rope was still attached to his waist and it fed up and out of the ice crevasse. And so he grabbed it and pulled on it until it all came tumbling back down and he saw it was frayed. And so sure enough, Simon had cut the rope. Now, even though Joe wasn't mad at Simon for the decision he made because he understood it was the right one, Joe still became very emotional when he saw this. He felt so alone, he was so sad. And for a little while, he just kind of freaked out and screamed and yelled and really just didn't know what he was gonna do. And then after that, he sat down knowing he wasn't getting out of here and that he was gonna die a slow, horrible, painful death. Joe remembers reaching up and turning off his headlamp, which retrospectively he thought was kind of goofy because he's just realized he's about to die inside of this crevasse and he's saving batteries. But with the light off, he's sitting on the ledge and he hears all the sounds that are coming from inside of this crevasse. It was this awful grinding sound, like a moaning sound. And he said it was so terrifying sitting in the darkness, listening to the sound that he reached up and turned his light back on just for comfort. Back up on the mountain, Simon was devastated. He felt like he had just killed his friend. And even though he understood why he did it and understood it was probably the right decision, it didn't change the fact that he felt incredibly guilty about it. And so that night he didn't even move from the position he was. He dug a little snow cave and he laid down and eventually fell asleep. The next morning when he got up, he began moving his way down the mountain and he finally rounded the area where Joe had been hanging off of that cliff and he got a chance to look down and see where Joe might have wound up. And to his horror, he's looking down and he sees this massive opening to a crevasse that seemed almost bottomless. And now this confirms that Joe definitely has died because he fell in there. But nonetheless, Simon goes down and goes to the edge of the crevasse and yells into Joe. He's screaming for him to call out if he's still alive. But after a while, he never heard anything from Joe. And with a heavy heart, Simon turned around and started heading back to base camp. A little while after Simon had left, Joe finally woke up. He had been asleep when Simon was yelling down for him. And so Joe wakes up, he's looking around, he can't believe this wasn't a bad dream. He starts yelling for Simon because he doesn't know what else to do. But after a while, he realized Simon's not gonna come down here to get me. He cut the rope, he thinks I'm dead already. At this point, Joe decides he needs to try to climb out of the crevasse, even with a broken leg. And so he gets himself in position, he gets his ice picks, and he starts making his way up this ice wall, but he can't put any weight on his broken leg and he keeps falling down. And he's realizing, I can't climb this. I probably couldn't climb this with two good legs, let alone with this broken one. And so Joe had two choices. He could wait on the ledge and hope to be rescued, but by his calculations, it was unlikely someone was gonna come out here and rescue him anytime soon because Simon is gonna say he's dead. So wait on the ledge and probably die a slow, painful death or he can go down deeper into the crevasse, which he has no idea where it goes, and hope somewhere down in that black void, there's an opening that leads back out to the outside of the mountain. So he made his choice, screwed an anchor into the ice, put his rope through it, he tested it to make sure it would hold his weight, he looked down into the void one last time and knew that as soon as he stepped off of this ledge, he could not come back up again. This was a one-way trip. And if he made it to the bottom of his 300-foot rope and he didn't find a ledge or a tunnel or something to put his feet on, he would slip off and fall to his death on purpose. He did not put a knot 
at the end of his rope because he figured either I'll find a way out or I won't, but at least it'll be quick. Down he went about 80 feet into this pitch black crevasse. He has no idea what's down there. And he gets to a point where the walls kind of come together and he was able to squeeze through it. And he realized once he got through that point, it was like the center of an hourglass where below it, it kind of opened up. And as soon as he pushed through, he could actually see to the ground. He saw flat ground and there was light shining on it, which meant there was a hole leading out into the mountains somewhere down there. And so he went all the way down, he touched the bottom, it was solid ground, he disconnected from his rope, and he climbed his way up this incline to where the sun was coming in, which was this hole that led right back out onto the mountain. And sure enough, he crawled out and tumbled out and the sun is shining on him. And he remembers just laying on the mountain, looking at the sun and laughing. He couldn't believe it. But after the initial relief of not dying wore off, he realized he was not out of the woods yet. He still needed to climb down the rest of the mountain and there wasn't that much left to climb. He was towards the bottom and it wasn't that steep. But after that, he would need to navigate five miles back to base camp. But over several delirious, painful, miserable days, he managed to crawl all the way back to base camp and he got there right as Simon was packing up the tent and getting ready to leave. He could not believe he saw Joe alive. Joe said Simon just swore. He just endlessly swore. He was cussing. He couldn't even speak. He didn't understand. It was like he was looking at a ghost. But after that kind of crazy initial interaction, Simon just gave Joe a big hug and Joe and Simon just cried and held each other. Joe underwent six surgical operations to repair the damage done to his leg and Dr would tell him that you're never going to climb again and you're probably going to struggle with walking for the rest of your life. But after two years of intense rehabilitation, Joe was not only walking just fine, he was mountain climbing. As for Simon, he managed to leave the mountain without any serious physical injury, but he carried with him an enormous sense of guilt that he still carries today. Joe consistently says Simon made the right decision and in every interview he does, he always makes sure to say, Simon is not at fault. It was an impossible situation. He made the right call. Joe wrote a book about the experience called Touching the Void and it sold millions of copies worldwide and has since been adapted into a major motion picture. As for Joe and Simon, apparently they've drifted apart over the years, but they still consider each other friends. In 1994, 39-year-old Mauro Prosperi took part in the brutal Marathon des Sables, which is a six-day endurance race covering 155 miles through the Sahara Desert. The competition was known as one of the toughest in the world, but Prosperi was a former Olympic athlete and he kept himself in unbelievable physical shape. He was also a police officer back in Italy, which kept him even more active, so he felt ready. The competition's desert terrain was so dangerous that participants had to indicate where they wanted their bodies sent if they did not survive the race. In preparation for the race, Prosperi would run 25 miles a day for weeks leading up to it, and he would give himself less and less water as he was running to get accustomed to dehydration. But despite how much he was training and his incredible athletic resume that showed he's someone that can probably do this, his wife was very concerned. But he would tell her, you know, the worst thing that's going to happen to me is I'll get a little sunburned. The race kicked off at its starting point in Morocco on April 10th, and initially it was going very smoothly. Prosperi was always at the front of the pack, and he was always the first Italian to finish that day's stage. And so when he would finish, he would go to his tent and he'd put an Italian flag on the outside to show the other Italians doing the race where they could find him to come inside and chat. And he would say that part of the race was really fun. Then things went wrong on the fourth day during the longest and most difficult phase of the race. When he set out that morning, it was already very windy and he found himself in this section between these two big sand dunes and the pace setters had already gone way ahead so he's totally alone. And then out of nowhere, this massive sandstorm kicks up and completely blinds him. He can't go anywhere because he can't see where he's going. And so he manages to kind of feel his way to this rock where he gets down behind this rock and he thinks to himself, I'll just wait it out and then continue on but the sandstorm raged for eight hours. And when it was finally done, it was totally dark outside, so Prosperi couldn't see anything. So he decides, you know what, I'm gonna have to sleep on the dunes and tomorrow morning I'll have to get up and keep going. And his biggest concern at this point was not that he was in a survival situation. It was, man, I was in fourth place in this race and now with this huge setback, I'm probably gonna finish last. And so when he went to sleep that night, all he was thinking about is, man, I gotta get up and go as fast as I can so I don't finish last tomorrow. 
But when the sun came up the next morning, Prosperi looked around and he realized he had a much bigger problem. The sandstorm had been so strong, it had completely altered the landscape. The dunes had all moved around. He had no points of reference. And so even though he had a map and he had a compass, he had no way to orient himself, so he had no idea what direction to go. Anybody that competed in this race really needed to be self-sufficient. And so Prosperi had a knife, he had plenty of dehydrated food, he had a sleeping bag, but he had very little water. He had about a half bottle of water because at each of the checkpoints during the day, the race officials would give you all of this water. And the idea was you would drink it all by the time you got to your next checkpoint. And he had not made it to the next checkpoint and so was very low on water. As he's looking around, realizing this is a really bad situation, he thinks to himself, you know, other runners must have had this same thing happen to them. They probably had to hunker down yesterday during the sandstorm and they're, they're just waking up now, they're looking around. I'm bound to find someone, we'll link up and we will get to the end of this race and we'll be just fine. And so he runs to the top of a sand dune and looks around expecting to see someone and he doesn't. There's no one in all directions. It's just completely barren desert. And so he leaves that sand dune, goes up another one and does the same thing. He's looking around and there's nobody there. And over the course of several hours, he was just running to the peaks of these different sand dunes, expecting to see someone, not seeing anyone, becoming more panicked and expending more energy. And finally, by the late afternoon, when he's sweating profusely and the sun is bearing down on him and he still hasn't seen anyone, he realizes he's gonna die if he keeps doing this and he needs to be smart about this. And so at this point, he went into survival mode and he decided that the only times he's gonna move are gonna be at night and in the early morning hours because those are the times when the sun is not up and it's still pretty cool and he can conserve energy that way. He also began peeing into bottles and began conserving his urine to drink later when he did run out of water. And so over the next two days, he conserved his energy, but he was just kind of drifting through the desert and he wasn't really getting anywhere. He didn't know if he was making progress because he had nothing to go to. He wasn't seeing anyone and he was starting to realize the situation is getting worse and worse by the minute. And then in an incredible stroke of luck, he comes across this Muslim shrine in the middle of nowhere that Bedouins would use as they traveled across the desert. Then he ran inside hoping that there'd be a person in there. And there was a person in there, but they were dead inside of a coffin. But he was happy that he now had shelter over his head and this felt like progress. He began taking stock of his new surroundings and when he was inside the shrine looking up into the ceiling, he saw it was lined with hundreds of bats. And at this point, he's really hungry, he's really thirsty, and so he climbed up into the rafters and began grabbing handfuls of bats and drinking their blood. After drinking the blood of 20 bats, he used some of the wood that was inside of the shrine and he built a fire outside. And that would be his way to signal planes and helicopters going overhead that he assumed would be out looking for him. And so he sets the fire and he comes back inside expecting, you know, over the next couple of days, someone's bound to find him, but nobody does. And four days go by and three separate times, a plane or a helicopter flew directly over him. And he's got his fire going, he's out there flagging him down, but nobody saw him. And so at the end of those four days, he's now been out in the desert roaming around for nearly a week. And he's starting to realize that this is the end. He's not going to survive this. No one knows where he is. No one's seen him so far. He's running out of supplies. This is it. And so knowing he was staring down a long, painful death, either by dehydration or starvation, he decided he was going to expedite it. And he would say later that he did not feel sad about this. It just was a logical choice he was making. He figured this way, if he died inside of the shrine, the shrine was more likely to be found than if he had died somewhere out in the desert where sand would cover him up. And so he said it was more likely people would find the shrine and therefore find him. And so there'd be closure for his family. And so Prosperi took a piece of charcoal from the fire, wrote a message to his wife and then cut his wrists and laid down expecting never to wake up again. But the next morning he woke up and he had barely bled because his blood was too thick. He literally could not bleed to death. He took this as a sign that he was supposed to live and he suddenly felt motivated to survive. He decided to leave the shrine and follow the advice that one of the race organizers had given all of them at the start, which was if you get lost, follow the clouds you can see just beyond the horizon at dawn, there you will find civilization. So Prosperi hopped up and began heading towards what he believed were those clouds. He walked for days 
days in the desert, grabbing snakes and lizards off the ground and eating them raw. He said his inner caveman came out like his primal desire to live, and he had no problems eating the things he was eating. Prosperi grew so dehydrated, he couldn't even urinate anymore. So he began drinking the liquid inside of succulents that grew inside of dried up riverbeds, and he also began sucking out the moisture in his wet wipes that were in his backpack. On the ninth day, Prosperi saw a little shepherd girl off in the distance, and she saw him, and she was scared of him, and she turned and ran away. And at first, Prosperi is devastated because he has no strength to chase after her, but she had actually gone down to her tribe and told them about this strange man wandering the desert, and they came running up over the dunes, and they brought him in, and they gave him food and drink, and they sent someone to get police. After police picked him up and brought him back to their headquarters, he discovered he had walked over 181 miles from where he had gotten lost on the course all the way to Algeria. His family and race organizers had gone out looking for him after he went missing, but all they ever found was his shoelace, and so they assumed he was dead. It would take him two years to fully recover from this ordeal, but after he did, he went on to run eight more desert races. In 2012, 35-year-old Jose Alvarenga was an extremely experienced fisherman, having spent years and years commercially fishing. In November of that year, Jose volunteered to do a 30-hour deep-sea fishing shift for his company off the coast of his hometown in Mexico. He hoped he'd be able to catch some sharks, marlins, and sailfish, three of the more lucrative fish you can catch. Unfortunately, the guy Jose usually went deep sea fishing with was not able to go at the last minute, but Jose still really wanted to go out and do the shift, and so he took the only other fisherman in their company that was willing to go or that could go, and it was a 23-year-old, extremely inexperienced, brand new fisherman named Ezekiel Cordoba. And while Jose knew he was not gonna be a huge asset out on the seas, he figured, you know, it's a short trip and we're not that far off from shore, so you know what, he's fine, I'll take him. On November 17th, the pair set out on their 24-foot fiberglass skiff with a small motor. On board were various fishing tools, a radio, and a large ice box to hold all the fish they were going to catch. Once they reached the area they were going to be fishing, their trip immediately started paying off, and within just a couple of hours, they had already almost completely overloaded the ice box. Their luck was so good that when they saw a storm coming in, they decided to wait and continue to catch as many fish as they possibly could before heading in at the very last minute. But the storm that was rolling in was like the storm of the century. And by the time they did turn around to head into shore, it was too late. They got caught up in this wicked storm where the rain was so intense, they literally could not see to shore. They tried to use their compass and other instruments to navigate to shore, but between the winds and the waves and the fact that their boat was so heavy from the nearly thousand pounds of fish they had caught, they were just really unable to get anywhere near shore. When the storm just continued to rage and they were just kind of floundering in the water, they decided they needed to dump their catch. So they dumped all 1,000 plus pounds of fish back into the water. But even then, with a more agile boat, the storm was so severe, they just could not navigate effectively. And so Jose turned off the engine and told Ezekiel that their best chance here was to just wait it out. And once it was done, they would head back into shore. But that storm continued to rage for five days. The torrential rain never stopped. The waves were huge. The winds were awful. And before long, they were getting pulled out to sea and had no idea where they were. Now, they had only planned to be out for 30 hours, so they did not have much in the way of supplies. And so after a few days, they had run out of food and they had run out of water. But luckily, because it was raining so much, they were able to drink the rainwater. But the real immediate problem they were facing is over the course of those five days, the storm was just battering their boat, and by the time the storm cleared, their boat was ruined. Their motor had been torn off and was just gone, their electronics were busted, and all of their fishing gear was either damaged or gone. There was enough charge in the radio for Jose to call back to his boss on the mainland and send a mayday message, but the radio died before they got a return message, so they weren't able to confirm if anybody on land was going to come looking for them. Left with minimal supplies, no radio, no motor, Jose and Ezekiel just had to hope somebody on the mainland heard their message, and they slowly began to adjust to life at sea. 
Jose was able to leap into the water and catch turtles, fish, seabirds, and jellyfish with his bare hands, and so that's what they ate. And then the two of them would try to catch rainwater whenever they could, but the majority of the time they had to drink their own urine and turtle blood. Despite their initial optimism that their boss had probably heard their Mayday message and would be sending people out to get them, as days turned into weeks and weeks turned into months, they realized that probably no one was coming to find them. Now their only hope was a plane spotted them flying overhead, or perhaps they could drift into a shipping lane and a boat could spot them. But without any way of navigating their boat, they really were just leaving it up to luck. Despite their dire situation, Jose stayed really positive and he focused on catching food and catching water, and he tracked the time really diligently by tracking the phases of the moon. Ezekiel, however, just did not have a significant role on the boat because he just wasn't skilled enough, and so he found himself sitting in the boat most of the time doing a whole lot of nothing, and he fell into a deep depression. He was not accustomed to being out on the water the way Jose was. Jose had been raised on the water. He practically only ate seafood, and a lot of it he ate raw. So in a way, Jose was kind of at home, Ezekiel was not. And then by the fourth month, Ezekiel just could no longer stomach the food they were eating. He would just get sick every single time. And so he just kind of gave up and he stopped eating. And even though Jose urged him to eat and would get him food, he didn't eat it and eventually he starved to death. Even though Ezekiel was not a huge asset in terms of helping them survive, he did provide Jose an enormous amount of comfort. It was like you had your partner in crime here. And then once he died, Jose was alone for the first time in nearly half a year and he fell into a very dark depression. And for six days, he did not touch Ezekiel's body. He just sat there and stared at him and even contemplated taking his own life. But on the seventh day, he doesn't know what it was, but he had this sudden urge to want to survive. And so he gave Ezekiel a kind of makeshift funeral. He said a few words and then disposed of his body in the ocean. And then after that, Jose became laser focused on just surviving. And survive he would for another nine months, all by himself, out in the middle of the ocean, just floating around, drinking turtle's blood and drinking his own pee. But after those nine months, he would finally see the thing he had been dreaming about, land. He had managed to drift all the way to the Marshall Islands. So he leapt out of his boat, he swam to shore, and there was a hut right on the beach. He knocked on the hut and a couple came to the door and they were totally shocked to see this guy. I mean, he, he didn't look too good. And they couldn't even believe his story. They, they couldn't believe that he had survived for so long in the water. But they quickly brought him inside. They gave him some food and drink and they contacted authorities and he was saved. His parents and young daughter, when they found out he was alive, they were overjoyed. They, along with everybody else, believed he had perished. They had sent out a search party for them and they'd found pieces of their boat that had broken off in the storm. And so they assumed, you know, they must have sank. Then in a strange turn of events, shortly after he got home, people began accusing him of lying about what happened. People said he looked too good to have been out on the open ocean for 14 months. He should have been emaciated and at the very least he should have had scurvy. But doctors would say he ate so many turtles and seabirds that he was pretty well fed and turtles and seabirds contain a high level of vitamin C that would have protected him from scurvy. Other skeptics said it would have been impossible for his skiff to float the 6,000 miles to the Marshall Islands where he ultimately found land. But then a study done at the University of Hawaii confirmed there was a current that would have pulled him from the coast of Mexico straight into the Marshall Islands. And then lastly, Ezekiel Cordoba's family accused Jose of killing Ezekiel and eating his body for sustenance. That's the only way he was able to survive. But Ezekiel roundly rejected that and took multiple lie detector tests that proved he did not do that. Today, Jose lives in a small town in El Salvador, completely surrounded by land, and he says he doesn't go anywhere near the water. In 1971, Julian Kepka was a bright-eyed German teenager who had just graduated high school. On Christmas Eve of 1971, she and her mother were at the airport in Lima, Peru, waiting for a flight to Pacopa to visit her father, who was a zoologist working in the Amazon. She and her mother and everybody else waiting for this flight were really annoyed because the flight was seven hours late due to bad weather. 
Finally, it arrived and Julianne, her mother, and everybody else who had been waiting boarded Lanza Flight 508. And immediately after takeoff, they started hitting some pretty bad turbulence because of the bad weather, but Julianne really liked flying, so she didn't mind. Her mother, on the other hand, was white knuckling the armrests. But after 10 minutes or so, as they were getting nearer to cruising altitude, the turbulence was not getting any better. In fact, it was getting much worse, and Julianne was starting to get worried herself. And then when the plane started shaking so violently that all of the overhead bins opened up and luggage and wrapped presents and Christmas cake started pouring out, Julianne now began white knuckling the armrest. As she's sitting there, she looks out the window and she sees all this lightning right outside their window. And it was clear they were literally flying through a lightning storm. And so Julianne and her mother are just looking at each other, unable to speak because they're so scared. And they're listening to the other passengers screaming and yelling and everyone's starting to panic. And then the plane starts really shaking up and down like it's being lifted 50 feet and dropping 50 feet over and over. And then all of a sudden there's this bright flash inside of the cabin and then the lights go out and then they look out the left side and they see smoke and flames coming out of the engine that sits on the wing. And then the plane felt like it was just falling from the sky before it dipped into an aggressive nosedive and just started bombing straight down toward the ground. It turned out that big flash in the cabin was lightning striking the engine. Julianne would say, despite this unbelievable chaos, the worst moment imaginable, her mother grabbed her by the hand and said, this is it, it's all over. And that was the last thing her mother ever said to her. After that, all Julianne can remember is the sound of other passengers screaming and crying and the awful grinding sounds that the engines were making. And as she's listening to these horrible sounds getting ready to die, all of a sudden the noise just stops and she's outside of the plane. She's still strapped into her seat, but now she's in free fall away from the plane. And she remembers thinking how unbelievably lonely she was. And then she looked down and she saw the canopy of the jungle fast approaching and she knew she was about to die and then she passed out. She remembers nothing of the actual impact, but she would later find out the plane broke up two miles up. So she was in free fall for two miles in that seat before hitting the ground. She woke up the next day looking upwards towards the jungle canopy, and the first thing she said out loud was, I survived. And she's looking around and she yells for her mother, but there's no one around her, no one yells back. And that's when she realizes, I'm all alone and probably everybody, including my mother, is dead. She had somehow managed to not only survive, but only have a broken collarbone and some deep cuts in her leg. She could hear planes overhead that were most likely looking for the crash site and potentially survivors, but she couldn't see them because the canopy was so thick, so they couldn't see her. She was wearing a very short sleeveless mini dress and flip-flops, but in fact, she had lost one of her flip-flops, but elected to keep the other one on because she had lost her glasses in the crash and she was incredibly nearsighted. And so she would use this one flip-flop to test the ground ahead of her before committing with her bare foot. Before the crash, she had spent a year and a half at her parents' research station out in the Amazon. And in that time, she had picked up very valuable survival skills for being in the rainforest. So the first thing she did was stand up and go looking for a stream because her father had told her wherever there's a stream, that stream will oftentimes lead to civilization. And so she began walking and sure enough, she found a stream. And instead of just walking next to the stream, she got in it and began walking directly in the middle of the stream because her parents had told her that you're less likely to get attacked by a predator if you're standing in the water versus standing on land. She only walked a little ways before she came across the crash site. There was no bodies, it was just debris, and all she could find that was useful was a small bag of candy. So she took the bag of candy and continued walking down the stream. And for several days, she trudged along and she would say during the day, it was incredibly hot and miserable. And at night, it was very cold. And since she only had this small dress on, it was particularly miserable. But she said the scariest part of the whole ordeal was at night when you're trying to sleep, it's totally pitch black and you're in the middle of the Amazon and there's predators all around you. She said it was horrifying. On the fourth day of being in the jungle, as she walked down the stream, she heard the sound of a landing king vulture, a sound that she recognized from her time spent at her parents' Amazon reserve. And the sound of this vulture was just around the corner, so she couldn't see it, but she knew these huge vultures only showed up if there's a ton of dead meat. And so she knew as soon as she rounded that corner, she was going to come face to face with the bodies from the crash, potentially even her mother. But she kept moving forward, she turned the corner, and sure enough, there were bodies. The vulture took off and what she was left looking at was a bench with three passengers on it still buckled in and all three of their heads had been rammed underneath the earth. They had clearly landed head first. Immediately, she had an intense sense of panic because she had never seen a dead body before 
and she thought one of them was her mother. But when she went over to examine this particular corpse, she saw her toenails were painted pink and her mother never painted her toenails. And so she had this intense sense of relief that it wasn't her mother, but at the same time felt very ashamed of that thought. There was nothing on the three bodies or near them that could help her survive. And so she said her goodbyes and she continued walking down the stream. By the 10th day of this ordeal, she could barely stand straight because of a broken collarbone and the pain in her leg. And so she began drifting down the river in one of the deeper sections. And then she thought she was hallucinating when she saw this big boat docked up against the side of the river. But when she went up to it and touched it, it was real. She went up on shore, she looked inside, there was no one in the boat, but it looked like a boat that was used. And there was a path that led back into the jungle. And so she followed the path and it led to this hut and no one was in there, but outside was a jug of gasoline. And she had this wound in her arm that was full of maggots. And she remembered her father using gasoline to get maggots out of a wound in their dog. And so she took the gasoline and dumped it in her arm and she said it was excruciatingly painful, but she was able to pull out 30 maggots and felt very proud of that accomplishment. After that, she fell asleep inside of the hut and just hoped that whoever lived here eventually showed up. And sure enough, the next day she woke up and she heard two men talking outside that were walking towards her. And she said the sound of their voice was like the sound of an angel. And when the two men came up the path and saw her, they were obviously very shocked. And they initially thought she was like this water goddess from a local legend that involved a half mermaid, half woman that was light skinned. And she would tell them in Spanish that she's not a water goddess, that in fact, she's a girl and she had just survived a plane crash and she really needed their help. It was getting late that day, so they couldn't bring her out of the jungle right away. So they helped treat her wounds. They gave her some food and water. And the next day they brought her back to civilization. The day after her rescue, she was reunited with her father and apparently he was so overcome with emotion because he believed she was dead that for several hours he just couldn't speak. Julianne was the sole survivor of the 91 people who boarded Lanza Flight 508. Her mother actually survived the crash but then died several days later because she couldn't move. This is something that haunts Julianne and her family because they think about how horrible those last few moments for her mother must have been. Julianne ultimately recovered from all of her physical injuries but to this day deals with significant emotional trauma. If you enjoyed today's story, be sure to come back next week because we put out a brand new mind-boggling medical mystery each week from Balin Studios and Wondery. This is Mr. Balin's Medical Mysteries, hosted by me, Mr. Balin. A quick reminder, the content in this episode is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. This episode was written by Matt Almas. Our editor is Heather Dundas. Sound design is by Ryan Patesta. Coordinating producer is Sophia Martins. Our senior producer is Alex Benedin. Our associate producers and researchers are Sarah Vitak and Natalie Bettendorf. Fact-checking was done by Sheila Patterson for Ballin Studios. Our producer is Alyssa Tomine. Our head of production is Zach Levitt. Executive producers are myself, Mr. Ballin and Nick Witters. For Wondery. Senior managing producer is Ryan Lohr. Our head of sound is Marcelino Villapando. Our producer is Julie Magruder. Additional support from Natalie Shisha. Senior producers are Laura Donna Palavoda, Dave Schilling and Matt Olmos. Our executive producers are Aaron O'Flaherty and Marshall Lewis.